also, uh, this is uh, smelting steel huh? from iron ore okay. in, uh, from Lake Michigan, right? This is from Lake Michigan? Lake, Lake, Superior. Lake Superior, iron ore. This is, this is after he's already separated everything out of it. Okay. With magnets and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'm I'm arriving a little bit late to the party here. Yes, you are. Um, I had a meeting and I actually showed up here in a suit, <laughs> like no joke. So uh, so well, what what am I looking at here? Bring a little class. <laughs> That's right. Bring some class to the event. Uh, what You're looking at a smelter? It's it's based on a European style smelter, so it's tall and skinny and vertical, uh -huh. as opposed to a Japanese smelter, which is like a big trough. <laughs> And if it, essentially what you do is you alternate charcoal and iron ore Okay. as it feeds into it. The, the pipe there is for the air blast control. Okay. But it's got a water cool tip so it doesn't melt down. Okay. And then the bloom will form immediately under the back. Okay. And what happens at the bloom? Well, what happens, you feed it iron ore, and iron ore are oxides of iron. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I'm using magnetite and hematite. Okay. Fe203 and Fe304. Mm -hmm. And what you do is a reduction process where you're driving off the oxygen molecule, leaving the iron. Okay. And then the iron centers together down where the bloom forms. Okay. Yep. And on the way down, also depending on feed rates and ratios and whatnot, it can pick up carbon or not, depending on how you set it up. Okay. But for knives and things, you do want it to pick up some carbon. So it's picking up the carbon from the lump charcoal. From the charcoal. Yep. Which at, at this point is uh, Royal Oak. Hardwood lump. Now, is there? Have you ever? Uh, I I know nothing about this process. Is there a a reason why you would use charcoal instead of coal? Yeah. Well, they've always used charcoal traditionally. My guess is is that coal has too much other nasty stuff. Coal. Yeah, in like it. sulfates Primarily and all sulfur. the. Yeah. Yeah. And this is just how it was always done. So when you look at you know old history of France and pictures and stuff, how France had no trees. Right. This was why. They were making charcoal to make steel for Napoleon's armies, and they just cut down all the trees. Excuse me for a moment. Okay. i got to keep rolling. He's got to keep rolling, because yep. every six minutes, he's got to add stuff to it. Right. Like, he's, right now, he's going to add his ore. So there goes a, about a, a three-quarters of a cup of iron... Um, iron ore. And how do you get the iron ore? This particular iron ore came from black sand on the shore of Lake Superior. Okay. And we're in your way. No, I'm just seeing what I got to do next. And I separate it out using a rare earth magnet, okay, as well, and that gets the magnetite out. Okay. But hematite is not very magnetic, so I use a very fine screen to separate the hematite from the silica sand. Okay. Very cool. And, and I could show you the before and after, but that's the after. Right. I try to be a good nerd and only change one thing at a time on a smelt so I can keep track of it. Right. Time. So you can always look back and if something right. doesn't work out the way you want it to, you can trace down what right. happened. Rather than tinkering with the ore and tinkering with the air rate and tinkering. The only change today from the last smelt I did is the brand of charcoal. Okay. And you're, yeah, so you usually get your stuff, Jim says, from a single source from a guy. Local guy. Yeah. yeah. And it's excellent charcoal, but he doesn't make it in the wintertime. Okay. And I have just enough of his stuff left for one smelt if I really need to do it. If you really need but it. But I'm going to use that for a secondary process called Orishigani, where you take the bloomery material, remelt it to adjust the carbon content. Okay. Very cool. So yeah, so. As Yep. So. Theoretically, at the bottom of that stack, uh, there's molten uh, iron. Usually, it doesn't quite melt. Okay. There will be little melted spots on it, but usually it's centered. So, think of it as you know, taking sugar and, and starting to get it hot, but not quite enough to melt it. So right. The little granules stick to each yep. other. Okay. That's pretty much what's happening. All right. And then you every every now and again you add charcoal to the top of that. Right. And every uh, six minutes. Well, every six. <laughs> well, what I'm finding with the commercial charcoal is the burn rate's very inconsistent. Okay. Even with so you're not just... messing with the air rate, I'm going. You know, what I wanted with this was about six minutes and 45 seconds. Okay. I'm getting everything between five minutes and seven minutes. Okay. Without touching anything. Okay. And that's just because there's a lot of unburnt wood in that charcoal. Yep. And different species of trees, and yep. on and on and on. 
where my good charcoal is odds and ends and scraps from Michigan Maple Block. Okay. And it's almost all maple. It's probably 95% maple. Very cool. Yep. And so uh, this this air thing, you've got a uh, that just looks like a standard forge well, air pump. That's a bouncy house blower from eBay. A bouncy house blower. Nice. You betcha. Straight yeah. Through. Same thing, and then it's connected with a... Just uh, a flex pipe yep. coming up to here, and a gate valve to control the volume of air. Okay. It's just on the other side is the handle. Yep. Then here I've got a number three welding lens, so you can peek down and see what's going on inside. Oh, I see, yeah. And then this is the water cool tip. Water cool tip, and that's so it doesn't melt when it's in the bottom. Right, and it would melt. Traditional is either cast ceramic or heavy copper. Okay. Because copper, if you've got enough of it sticking out, it'll stay cool as well. Yep. So what I'm looking at here is essentially a piece of uh, sheet metal. Uh, well, it's, wrap a it's a chimney flue yep. in the inside, just like the one sitting over there on the pallet. Okay. It's a oh, I see. So that with the ceramic wool wrapped around it and yeah. sheet metal to hold everything in place. So like KO wool. Right. Yeah, and then the and that kind of insulates stuff a little bit better. And then yeah, uh, very cool. And then uh, at the bottom there, um, you built kind of a uh, looks like some sort of a a little fire box. What's this fire brick? It's just standard yeah. fire brick stacked up to give me the chamber size that I want. Yep, and then you've, you've packed in the front hole with uh, kale wool. Right after I took out the brick. Yep. Oh, okay. Initially it's got a brick in it until okay. it's time to tap the slag. Then okay. I pull the brick and I re the hole with the wall just because okay. it's easier. Very cool. And plus if I start to get a build up of slag in there, I can scoot right underneath that wall with my poker. Yeah. And just have a little tiny hole for it to run out. Yep. Rather than opening up a hole. Yeah, you're losing a bunch of heat in there and stuff. Well, and changing the air, I well, suppose that's, it that's would the change the air. Thing, flow. It changes the burn characteristics and instead of all the air going up, now yep. some of the air would be going down and out. Yeah, and down and out. So yeah, so uh, that whole fire stack is gonna change. Yep. Yep. Very cool. So from, from where we're sitting at over there with the iron ore uh, to where we're at, at to the, so let's say we just start with the iron ore and forget about harvesting the sand and sifting all sure. of it. Um, from the time you start uh, the smelting here mm -hmm. to the time you're done, how long does it take to get? Typically about seven hours to get through a smelt. Through a smelt, and then how much steel will you end up at the end of that? Well, if everything works good, I end up with about a third by weight of what I started with. Okay. So if I put in 30 pounds, I'll get 10 out. Okay. But you know, sometimes it's as high as a third, sometimes it's as low as 20 percent. Okay. Depending on parameters and how you set things up. Okay. And then you've got a big blob that then needs to be forged flat. Yep. And Japanese sword style fold, folded on itself. Folded. Yep. Anywhere between typically 10 and 15 times. Yep. To make the steel homogenous and carbon content and work out the crud. Okay. And so that's a whole other day. Yeah, another day so to do in that. In general, the smelt is a day, and then refining the material is another day. Okay. If I take it through the Orishigani process to adjust the carbon content, that adds another five or six hours in there, too. Okay. And more loss. Okay. And, and then. I'm defeated again. Oh, yep. See, so now. Uh, the reason he's going to feed it is that uh, the charcoal level has sunk down about four inches from the top of his chimney there. Well, first the black stuff goes in. Oh yeah, so now about looks like about three quarters of a cup it's of It's actually the, a half cup in this Half case. cup, okay, of uh, the iron ore. And then next he's scooping up uh, a coffee can on a broom handle there of uh, charcoal put in the top there. Number 10 coffee can. Yep. And then with my stopwatch, I watch the rate till it burns down the level. And then I can use that to adjust my airflow. Okay. But essentially, Lee Sauter is kind of the guru of smelting in the United States. And actually all over the world right now. And he's come up with calculations of airflow rates that are Gauged by how quickly it burns charcoal. Okay. Because it takes you know, so many liters of air to burn so many kilograms of charcoal. Right. To uh, complete combustion. So based upon the the square area of your flue, uh huh, uh, 
Um, I think his magic number is 0.35 grams per square centimeter per minute of charcoal burn rate. It took him a long time to figure that out. A lot of smells. <laughs> yeah. and, and depending on what you do, you vary that a little bit. Him going that fast, and he, he's an ornamental blacksmith, he's after primarily a very low carbon iron product. Okay. And for him, being very solid is most important. Okay. I slow things down a little bit. I run between 0.25 and 0.27 okay. grams of charcoal per square centimeter per minute. Okay. And I get a slightly higher carbon content product. Okay. But it's usually not as solid. It's, it's more porous. It's got more crud in it than okay. what he gets. Okay. But I'm doing primarily straight razors and knives. Right. As opposed to ornamental stuff. Ornamental stuff that he's doing. Yeah, you yeah. should see the night you showed me the other day the picture. Nice. You probably shipped that out already. Oh yeah. It was I'm trying to think it was in the car to be nailed when yeah. I saw you. Yeah. So so um so let's say uh, you get your steel and you forge it flat and fold it over and get all the impurities out of it and all these sorts of things. Have you ever tested the steel that comes out of here as to what? Sure. So of course, of course you have, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a, asking. He's, he's the, 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 uh, I'm asking anticipating that you have an answer. <laughs> yeah, well, and, see, that was really fast. In, in, what, in, in what respect, though? Because I've got harvest so testers, micro harvest what, testers. What would you say? What would if uh, for the steel that I can commercially buy? What is it the closest to that you're able to produce? Um, well, you can vary the carbon content, but probably something like between 1084 and 1095. Oh yeah, so that's good stuff. But I yeah. got no manganese. Okay. And that's that's the big difference. Um, and manganese is huge for keeping grain size small. Plus, I've got silica inclusions no matter what I do. Yeah, right. I've got silica inclusions left over. From the sand. Well, not was... just from the sand, because if you use rocky ore, you get silica inclusions as well. Okay. And it's, it's just the way it is. And if you think about it, you know, everybody says, oh, Tamahagani is the best stuff on the planet. It's really cool. It's a really very time-consuming, somewhat difficult way to make a pr really pretty good product. But there's a reason why all this became completely obsolete when some smarty pants named Bessemer came along. Yeah, the Bessemer process. And made the Bessemer converter in you know, yeah. the 1850s. Right. They could get a better product, metallurgically a better product, for like 10% the cost. And yeah. So it's like, oh, never mind. We don't yeah, we won't, <laughs> we won't do this anymore. <laughs> well, if you think of strength and things like that, there's a reason why they put iron cores down the center of a katana. Yeah. Because... The, the Tamahagani, the hard steel itself, is not that strong, right? okay. relatively speaking. R to other now, stuff. to make a, a sword that's only going to cut people, it's fantastic. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just, it depends on what you're doing. It makes wonderful straight razors if you get it clean enough. If you've got big silica inclusions, it can really mess up your edge. Uh -huh. But if you get it clean enough, the silica inclusions small enough and few enough, even though it's a very high hardness, I, this, I can quench this stuff to Rockwell 67. Uh huh. Temper it back down to about 64. It's extremely hard. Oh, wow. But it's got very little abrasion resistance because it's pretty much just iron and carbon. Okay. So you can keep it sharp with just a strop for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. Whereas modern steels, after a month or so, you have to go back on the stones. Yeah. So it's, just, it's not better, it's just different. It's different different and handling characteristics it's, and stuff. It's, it's, Forte is for people who appreciate the time and the effort that it takes to make it and have something made just like it would have been you know, 500 years ago. Right. So, so when Kevin makes my sword... He needs to make it out of this shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sword. Well, Kevin's the one that got what? me started. Right. Kevin's the one... I'm getting a sword. Swords are... S words. <laughs> S words for 300. <laughs> yeah. Sword. Yeah. Sword. Yeah. All right, we're adding uh, more of the iron in there. And he's going to get another scoop. Four hours. And then when I take it apart and pull the bloom out, that's when it gets interesting. Gets neat, huh? Yeah. But right. basically, this is just a rinse and repeat thing all day long. Yeah, and I'm watching yeah. it to make sure I don't get too much slag plugging up the air hole. Okay. And what I'll do next is I'll knock a little bit of it out, out of the way. And then if it gets to be too much, that's when I tap it and drain it off. Okay. Very cool. So if you just had. 
The amount of uh, um, sifting in that that you start earlier, the more you sift, the more you separate, the less lag, right? Or no? Uh, not entirely, because it depends on the quality of the ore as well. But if I didn't sift it out, I would have a lot of slag with this particular ore source. I'd be tapping the slag every 10 minutes all afternoon. Now we're at the point here, um, I'm narrating the video at the same time here, that the slag is building up at the bottom of the furnace and it's trying to work its way out is how you would explain that? Yeah, there was a little bit of a hole I left here when I tapped it before. So oh, see. I see. So look at that. It's flowing in there now. Now is that steel that's flowing in or is that No, that's, that's, that's mostly silica. Slag. Okay, silica. Okay. There wasn't a lot in there, just enough to get our attention. Yeah. So all of that is slag. Where's the actual steel? Above this. Above it. Okay. Yeah, what? There we go. Okay. So more more of the stuff is starting to flow out on its yeah. own there. And so what a lot of guys will do is they'll leave the bottom open uh -huh. and just let it run on its own. Okay. And some people think it's a good idea, some people don't. For guys making just iron, it definitely seems like a good way to go. Okay. But since I'm trying to make steel, I, I try to keep the chamber fairly consistent as far as how it's running. Yeah. But what I'm doing is I'm going right underneath the bloom. Mm -hmm. And so the bloom is like a bird's nest. Okay. And there'll be a puddle of slag on the top. Okay. And then it'll fill up and flow over the sides. Flow over the sides. And the right. idea is to keep it flowing smoothly and consistently without building up so much that it blocks off your air. Yeah, so that you're talking about the slag, you want right. that to flow off. So at the end of this, you're going to end up with like a ball of steel? Yeah, kind of. A, if, it, if it's forming well, it'll be like a big bird's nest shaped blob with a depression in the center. Okay. Yes, it is. So the slag forms on top of the steel because it's it forms on top of the bloom. Yeah, and then it's it's lighter, and then that's why it runs off to the side, and the steel well, plus stays in this, place. This is liquid, whereas the bloom is a solid. Oh, it's still solid. Yeah. The, okay. The, the steel bloom because it's not really melting to form itself. It's just sticking. To it's itself. sticking to itself. Okay. It's centering. So is there is there a point where you do uh, where you where it melts? back together and well little corners and edges will actually melt okay but that's not the primary mechanism okay so once once you pull the the steel out of there mm -hmm. it's basically like uh, sugar that's been heated together um, but it's not like what you would think of as like a solid so how do you turn no, it, it into a quite, solid it is quite solid oh it is okay sure. just like a chunk of sugar if it centers together really well okay it'll be a solid chunk of sugar okay yeah do you ever get moisture in your bag of sugar yeah same thing yeah and only with heat then what i do is i forge it down flat though okay forge it into bars inspect it for carbon content and decide where to go next how do you do that um, forge it into plates about inch and a half wide, quarter inch thick, and oh, five or six inches long. Okay. Heat them up to 1600 degrees, quench them in water, and break them. Okay. And then take a look at what's going on inside. How do you take the look, though? I swear um, I'm getting at. So with that kind of stuff, I'll, I'll just look at how it breaks. Okay. Whether it snaps or bends before it breaks, that gives okay. you an idea. Okay. You can also look at kind of the sheen of it. Okay. Because at that point, it hasn't really been folded at all. Okay. And so if I'm really curious, I'll fold the whole thing a few times, take a sample, throw it in my metallurgical microscope, okay. and then I can tell exactly what it's done. Very cool. But you can use simpler methods to get a good idea of what's going on. Yep. If, if you have the experience looking at that sure. and doing it, yeah. But it's not rocket surgery, as they say. Rocket surgery. <laughs> <laughs> to, to mix my metaphors. There you go. <laughs> Right, all that's coming out of there is carbon dioxide and water. Yep. So we're at the point now where he is no longer adding iron or charcoal, and uh, now the idea is that this is the charcoal level is about here, and he's going to burn it down until it's all the way burnt off, 
and then we should be able to pull a lump of steel out of there. Yeah. It's legit. He's actually doing it in a day. You know? So he's, uh, he's knocking the bricks out because he's about to take the stack off and yeah. reveal the steel, uh, what do you call it, a blossom? The bloom. Bloom. I'm just knocking everything loose so it comes apart easy. Okay. So now we have to take the chimney off. I'm trying to preserve it a little bit. I'd like to use it one more time if I can, but it's not giving me the three. Okay. Okay. Wow, it's getting warm now. I just turned it on. Yes, it is. Yes. Wow, literally melting the fire bricks. Oh. <laughs> We're on fire! <laughs> you better not be on fire. It's kind of a funny shape of food. So that's the actual steel there. Yeah. With a lot of these pieces, like that piece there, mm -hmm. that's steel too. So I'll have to sort through this and pull out all those other pieces there. Yeah. But you're going kind of for the big one right now, yeah. right? I'm just okay. A big chunk. Go ahead, Matt. You need to get over that. And see, some of this is slag. So.
much, oh. you'll, you'll catch on fire too. Oh There's my gosh. But a lot, of this, <laughs> a lot of this is steel too. Okay. And so I'll sort through those because when I do the remelt, yeah. I can uh, remelt those. You can put those steel. back in. What's that? It's real. Solid. It's a dog of fire steel. Yeah. That, that, uh, but it's not as big as I thought, but that's okay. It's still a great bar of steel. So now he's uh, testing to see what is slag and what is uh, actual steel that's left. So that's obviously slag there. Oh, a little bit of steel there. I used to go through and pick out every little BB of metal. Yeah. I don't do that anymore. You're just looking for a big bar. Well, reason, you know, quarter size pieces are bigger. Okay. <laughs> so, then I'll just dig through this tomorrow. Okay. So then your your next steps to turn that into a uh, actual blade steel. Well, there's still more refining to be done. Okay. First, I gotta check and see how much carbon's in it overall. Uh huh. Like I described earlier. Yep. And if there's enough carbon in it, which I doubt because of the process we, we followed, but if there were, then I would just fold it and weld it to itself 10 to 15 times and forge a blade out of it. Okay. Or use it for the outside skin on like a, a sand mine construction really something okay. like that. I also use it for the cutting edge of straight razors. Okay. Now, if there isn't enough carbon in it, which is what I suspect, I'll forge it out in place just to be sure. Uh huh. And then I'll do a remelting process called either, it's called two names. Japanese is Orishigami. The European name is hearth refining. Okay. And you're remelting it to adjust the level of carbon. Okay. And from that, I'll lose about 20 to 25 percent of that material. Okay. Still end up with a bloom similar to that. Uh huh. But it'll be more solid and less slag. In it. Okay. And then that'll get forged down, checked for carbon again, then folded and welded on itself 10 to 15 times. And then I can make blades out of it. Very cool. So that's it. This so, is how it is off of the beach. Yep, so that's just regular black sand off the beach. And then, you know, this is pulling magnetite out of it. But see, it, it pulls silica sand with it too, so then I've got other processes to get that out. Okay. But that that's the idea. And then you've got this screen over here that at the end of it... At the end of it, as the last step in the process is use a real fine screen to separate the real fine hematite from the silica sand. Okay. And this was my last bloom. Nice. Ooh, that's heavy. <laughs> and in addition to that, ooh, crash bang. These were the odds and ends that I pulled out of the smelter. Oh yeah, so thing. you can turn that into something this later. This will get remelted, that Orishigani process. Yeah. I'll, I'll just remelt this, but it could be, if I were just going to use that bar, uh -huh. I could put these on top of that and forge weld them down. Okay. With some borax or whatever? Well, this stuff, initially it's got enough silica left in it. In the smelting process, you don't need a flux. Nice. Initially. Later on you do. Okay. And the Japanese will use clay and rice straw ash. I just use borax. Very cool. So, yeah, that was just more odds and ends. You know, even little pieces like this. Yeah. I don't throw them away. I can remelt them. Yeah. Eventually get uh, another bar out of all your odds and ends or right. make this one beefier. Wow. It all gets used. So there will be a main bloom. Mm -hmm. And then there will be odds and ends and pieces. Okay. You run down there through that mess and get to put a magnet and just pick up? No, because it'll pick up the slag too. Okay. The slag's got iron in it. So no, I just look for pieces that look like they're steel and then I hit them with a hammer. And if they crumble, you know they're, they're not. It's not steel. Yeah. yeah. So cool. So anyways, that's it. And this is, you know, you sit here for four hours to get everything prepped. Yeah. And ready to go. But that way my ore is consistent from smelt to smelt to smelt. Sweet. And take that variable out of it. Very cool. And then if I want to try a new ore, then I leave everything else the same yeah. and just run the new ore.